Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. My guest today is Daniel Zayla. He heads the multi-asset boutique at Von Tobel Asset Management, which also incorporates Vescor. This conversation looks at the evolution of multi-asset management at a time when many funds have struggled in this low yield environment. We look at the core allocation of these funds and how it's changed and whether this means the end of the traditional 60-40 portfolio. We also look at how investors sh- should base their expectations of a multi-asset fund, the role of strategic and tactical asset allocations, and how to incorporate risk and both view-based approaches into the investment process. And finally, we discuss what represents the biggest challenge for multi-asset funds today. I hope you enjoy the conversation. The first question I wanted to ask you today was, you know, what are the reasons why a lot of the multi-asset funds have been struggling in this current environment? Is it that we're in this low yield environment or is it that there's a lot of volatility? What do you think is driving the underperformance? Ultimately, it's uh, it's that diversification got pricey uh, due to the low yield environment. So all the technicals, they are pointing towards a environment where you do not really generate returns out of the bonds. And for a multi-asset manager, this means that he has to move away from his invincible core because a risky asset and non-risky assets are both part playing a crucial role in a multi-asset portfolio. So if you have to move away from government bonds, which are considered to be safe assets, then obviously your overall portfolio gets gets more risky. And that's what happened. Given the low yield environment, managers had to seek uh, yields somewhere else and uh, try to pick up yields in, for example, emerging market bonds, corporate bonds, so more risky asset than government bonds. Uh, The second uh, possibility would be to move a little bit towards illiquid assets, and this made the portfolio also risky. So by doing that, uh, you lost the diversification potential, and therefore uh, the core of every multi-asset portfolio. So when you talk about the core of the portfolio, losing the diversification benefit, is that that in the case where the markets have had significant pickup in volatility that they underperform? Um, Is that what you're describing? Yes. I mean, if you have a portfolio consisting of risky assets and non-risky assets and the non-risky part of the portfolio should basically help you in in, in down markets should help you when there is volatility in the market and this is not going to happen, then you underperform, let's say, the expectations of the investors. Uh, clearly, that was the case when looking back the last few years, yields being low, everything pointed towards uh, a lower potential in this safe, non-risky assets. I mean, apparently uh, we saw over the last year, nevertheless, good returns in these assets, but going back in this period and looking at the technicals, it was just simply not an attractive asset class to be if you evaluated the, uh, the potential of these asset classes on, of, the risk, of the non-risky asset classes uh, properly. So if what you're saying is that the fixed income you know, doesn't provide the defensive characteristics that you know, we really want or need in this type of environment, what does that then say about the 60-40 you know, balanced portfolio that a lot of funds still run today? I mean, obviously, uh, if you move away from this invincible core of, uh, of or invincible core in the past, at least, from 
from a multi-asset portfolio, it gets tricky. And especially in 60-40, so 60% equities and 40% bonds would be a tricky thing uh, or wouldn't make a lot of sense to have that, uh, I guess, going forward. So I, I, I think it is really a, a question whether investors should keep that. Is it also not just about the 60-40, but really uh, a revision of the expectations or the return you know, objective that they want from a multi-asset? Does, does that need to change given the new environment as well? Definitely. But I think the overall expectations or the overall uh, money management uh, views should should be adapted. I mean, let's 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 see right do you have saving plans where you basically take money and put it to the bank and get interest rates or you have terms such as investments and i think the two terms saving and investing they will have new meanings going forward because uh, on savings you don't get any interest rates i.e it's not saving. So I think investing gets the new saving. And this is definitely something where expectations will change. Mm -hmm. So overall, I guess, investing in multi asset portfolio will be considered the new saving. That's interesting. Do, does that then mean in this multi asset portfolio that investors need to then be a lot more strategic in how they think? Or do they need to also have this tactical lens? Because I think historically, the investment framework has always been very strategic in, in mindset. But given the volatility that we've seen today, you know, how do investors maybe blend both the composition of being strategic, but then thinking tactically about these dislocations that we're also observing in the market? I think uh, going forward, investors should be much more strategic about uh, uh, investing in multi-asset. They should basically think of uh, diversification primarily, because think about it, investing in multi-asset uh, is basically a risk. Uh, basically, when investing in multi-asset, you basically have a risk focus. That's all you have. Otherwise, you go in equities directly 100% of your portfolio. If you decide to go into a multi-asset portfolio, your focus is definitely risk. And therefore, uh, you need to be very, very uh, strategic about that. And given from a very solid, uh, solid base, you can implement tactical views but there also you need to be very systematic and strategic about that uh, in order to have an unbiased uh, management an unbiased i.e free of human judgments uh, of uh, of deceiving uh, facts uh, i think that's very important going forward that that conversation or that point you've just mentioned there about the you know, the the potential for bias in humans is a really interesting one because one of the questions that keeps coming up in the marketplace, particularly in Australia as well, and I think this is a global issue, is how to deal with market views that are seem to be so distinct from fundamentals and so distinct from financial theory. Uh, and so, does this systematic risk based approach that you describe is that helping you to try and map the differences here between what we're seeing happening in the market today versus the fundamental slash uh, financial theory based approach yeah so let's let's start again what do investors seek when investing in multi-asset they seek a risk focus they want to be in an investment which controls risk and i think that's that's, that's always the starting point. So when you then define the next step would be uh, to define a portfolio which is very equally distributed uh, in terms of risk through, through all the asset classes and which has a very strong, uh, a strong grip 
on the overall risk of the portfolio. So overall risk and equally distribution uh, in terms of risk contribution to the whole portfolio of the asset classes. That would be the starting point. And now, uh, starting at this very basic portfolio, you would implement views. And views is a difficult thing to, to, to generate very accurate views. We all know uh, the future is uncertain. So this is a difficult task. And you can do that uh, uh, discretionary, or you can use uh, quant models. I think as long as it's systematic, that's, that's, uh, that's the key. It needs to be systematic. So in order to, to improve it over time, only if it's systematic, you can learn. Then the next step uh, kicks in, and this is, a, is even a more crucial part. If you have views and you start to implement that, so what you basically do is you deviate from this very solid balanced in terms of risk portfolio. And obviously here you need to understand the trade off between your views and the risk you are deviating or you are getting by deviation of this very balanced portfolios. And I think there it's definitely uh, a, a it, it definitely, you need to have that quantitatively modeled because otherwise it gets very difficult because risk as such is an abstract thing, right? You, you cannot grab that, you cannot see that, you have to measure it. And this is quantitatively by nature. So I think overall multi-asset will move into a more quantitatively driven discipline. Uh, going forward, because this will be the, the, the key aspects, this trade off between your view and the additional risk you're getting into your portfolio. And to do that, you need to have a very solid infrastructure, a very solid modeling techniques. Well, let's dig into those modeling techniques, because one of the other issues or concerns around multi-asset is that it hasn't been able to maybe capture the changing market conditions and very volatile correlations we've seen um, between asset classes. You know, how do you then think about the different market regimes that can almost eventuate and then how to then take that market data and those signals and then implement it into a multi-asset style strategy? If we look back over the last 20 years, uh, we had a very specific, uh, we had a very specific regime. Basically, the regime can be characterized as the, as the, as the, the, the rise of the power of, of the central banks. Central banks, uh, starting in the 80s, became more dominant in terms of influencing the markets and led basically to a negative correlation between risky assets and non-risky assets. And this was, to my opinion, the perfect environment for every multi-asset portfolio. So being now uh, reaching the, the lower bound of the interest rate, uh, reaching the zero bound of the interest rate levels worldwide, uh, the question is whether this regime will continue to, to be uh, like it was 20, the last two decades. And that, that's, I think that's one of the most crucial uh, questions. If I look at the current landscape, I think that uh, the central banks are still very dominant and they still have the means and the tools to influence asset prices. And by doing that, I think they will continue to keep up this negative correlation between risky and non-risky assets. And I think that will be uh, also the, the key point for, for multi-asset uh, for multi-asset portfolios. However, uh, I mean now this year was a very particular year. We had uh, we had a lot of uh, 
locomotions in the market, let's put it this way, uh, which were uh, exogenous by nature, and clearly uh, multi-asset portfolios, which were, uh, which were including not which were including the or which which were following this yield pickup suffered a lot so i think overall this uh this investors need to revise their expectations uh over the next regimes that we have to to face lower lower returns as such is this the is this the the answer to your question or do you want to go here more technical no, that's I think a good a good place because my next um, corollary style question is around risk parity because you've talked about the need for this negative correlation um, between risky assets and and the more defensive assets. You know, risk parity has been a very successful strategy for a long period of time because it's been able to take advantage of lower and lower interest rates and that negative correlation has been there. I was curious around your thoughts that given we have started to see a large number of negative yielding um, bonds and you know particularly in Europe how does that then impact the you know the ability of multi asset to operate in in that environment where you need that uh, risk parity approach where you've got the negative correlation i mean a lot of people say and I'm coming back again to the same thing. A lot of people say, okay, risk parity is that because, I mean, notoriously, you have a large position in this uh, non-risky assets such as government bonds. However, uh, I would like to come back as well to my definition of saving and investing, right? If, if, if saving doesn't provide you any, any interest rates anymore, obviously, we have to, and obviously this cascades through all the, the, the other investments. So your, your starting point is below zero. So obviously everything which is above is some sort of uh, beneficial for, 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 uh, for investors. And I think risk parity as such is definitely a concept which provides you a very, very solid uh, risk allocation. First of all, it targets the volatility. It gives you, it takes away a lot of uncertainty by that. Uh, you know that your investment has X, Y, Z volatility. And obviously you also know by investing into a risk parity approach that most of your assets in the portfolio have more or less the same risk contribution. So it's a very, very stable portfolio. However, uh, clearly, if you, if you aim for, for, let's say, 200, 300 basis points about, uh, above the, 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 the risk-free level, then you have to consider whether this is going to be uh, the case going forward, since the bonds on the on the on the safe side you're using probably will not deliver the returns they used to have, and uh, so I think it's 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 crucial for investors to revise their expectations going forward. And I think a lot of pension funds. Uh, are 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 doing that. Uh, if they want to keep the expectations they had ten years ago, they will become more risky in their allocation. Otherwise, it's not working. I don't think risk parity, yes or no, is going to uh, to answer this question. Risk parity, I consider it more as a technical implementation of a portfolio and not as a a uh, how to say a a, a tar a return targeting strategy mm -hmm. can i touch a little bit more on the volatility targeting that you described I, i'm curious as to how that works in the current environment as well we've started to see more and more tail risk style uh, situations a pick up in volatility uh, more frequently uh, is is that ability to target vol 
in, in the same way that we used to say 10 years ago still applicable today or do we need to be a bit more range bound in the way that we think about volatility in, in portfolios that's a that's a very very good question especially for quant managers this environment was very challenging why was it very challenging because the way we measure risk the way we measure volatility i mean there are very very very, very uh, there are a lot of ways to to measure uh, volatility and risk however they all share a common a, a common base and given the 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 sudden movements in the market due to COVID-19, uh, we saw the volatility, the risk basically shooting up. And typically what you do then is you reduce your exposure in order to control the volatility. And this, and, and all the quant, all the risk-based uh, strategy, they share this, type of approach and what happened then is that you reduced your exposure uh, after the first hits of the COVID-19 and then you missed the rebound since the rebound was very very sentiment driven almost uh, and very skewed to tech uh, companies and uh, now the question is can, could we do that differently? Can we do that differently? Can we apply other techniques? I think measure risk, measure volatility will not be reinvented completely. So I don't think that we uh, will uh, tackle the problem by just using other risk measures. However, I believe what will uh, well, will be the development going, the research going forward is that we try to, to implement more intelligent risk models or risk management systems using uh, probably artificial intelligence techniques, which differentiates more uh, between uh, between drawdown, between the nature of a drawdown. So I could envision that route to go, but overall, I think uh, the, the 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 type of risk management techniques will not change that drastically. And by if investors want to have a risk control way to invest, they need somehow to take that into account that this kind of uh, market movements could hurt them. Uh, but I think uh, investors which are very clear about their uh, goal, uh, they do understand that uh, very well. So you mentioned there a little bit about AI. I'm curious around what do you think AI can, can give more insight on is it around sentiment in the market is it around connecting up flows is it around understanding maybe the interconnectivity between the market you know, there's a lot of people trading the same strategy in the market and i wonder as a systematic trader how do you think about um how everyone else is also behaving because this is not a you know this is an ecology this market everything's moving on top of each other how do you also think about how everyone else is also positioning yeah, I think AI will help you to cut through the noise of the market. So we'll be able to probably see the most dominant patterns in the market and therefore uh, will give you clarity. However, it will not revolutionize uh, the overall uh, investing uh, or in, will not revolutionize the way quant investors, systematic investors invested. I mean, uh, a lot of techniques are simply, uh, you know, are simply ha how to say that uh, old wine in new in new bottles or, or yeah, so, something like that. Yeah, no, I just I understand exactly what you mean. I but, think Australian use that as uh, with beer probably and not wine. 
<laughs> uh, we, we, we'll, we'll drink both. We'll drink both. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so basically, it's not going to revolutionize the way we we think about markets, uh, the way we invest. However, definitely it will add uh, new tools to our uh, toolkit. But I think most prominent uh, route is really to cut through the noise to probably uh, to probably uh, to probably put a number to sentiment because sentiment is something very abstract, right? So that we can basically understand what's driving the market uh, at this moment better by applying AI mm -hmm. techniques. Can we switch back to some of your discussion that you had around views and view-based approaches um, versus risk-based approach? And I'm like to get more of your insight in terms of how do you incorporate these views into a systematic approach um, with, with your fund? So basically our starting point is always a very solid, uh, in terms of risk, a very solid, stable portfolio. And then again, uh, if you formulate views, uh, what you what is crucial is that it's done systematically because only this will help you to evolve, to learn, to, to, to improve your methodologies. And the, the, the important thing about, uh, about views or, or, or formulating views is that it's, it's somehow simple. It, you cannot overcomplicate it. You cannot take into account all the different aspects which drive the markets. So you really have to focus on the main drivers. And these are not a lot. Basically, you see that uh, you have views, you have drivers in the, in, the, in the company space, so in the microeconomic space, and you have drivers in the macroeconomic space. And uh, so I would say uh, you should take overall a handful of drivers, which you really understand. And once you have formulated a view, then basically you have to implement that view in, uh, in, your, in your neutral starting point. And again, by doing that, you will deviate, you will take more risk on board. So what you need is a very solid framework to control this risk. So I give you an example. If you have a risk parity portfolio between equity and government bonds, and this portfolio is very well balanced. And now you implement the view that equity is, uh, is very positive going forward and bonds is very negative going forward. You will end up with a portfolio which is totally skewed towards your risky asset, towards your equity. And obviously, uh, given that you reduce your bond allocation, there is nothing which helps you in case your view is wrong. So basically, this trade-off is crucial, and there you need to have a solid risk, uh, a, a risk framework which, which allows you to tilt the portfolio, but not too much, uh, because if, I mean, we know future is uncertain. If you are wrong, basically you have nothing which saves you. And this framework, that's uh, that's basically the the. The key when implementing views. So this 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 risk this risk framework, which helps you to keep your portfolio balanced and stable. Do you attach a, a weighting to these views? Is there like a conviction level that you attach as, in terms of how much to then allocate extra risk to different ideas? A lot of techniques do that. Uh, the Bayesian techniques, where you where you implement uh, some some conviction levels uh, to that, we do that implicitly. Yes, we do that implicitly. We uh, we try to understand how how good our views are, uh, or how view how the current view how it worked in the in the in the past and. Uh, if the if the the view or if the way we formulated the view was very successful, we put more weight, 
and if uh, it was not that successful or we or the system considered that to risk or more risky it puts it puts less weight on this uh, on these views uh, and therefore uh, implements less uh, to a lesser degree the view we are currently having uh, so yes we put some conviction levels into that mm -hmm. Let's wrap up with a final question and a difficult one at that, which is what is the biggest challenge that you know, a lot of these multi-asset funds face in terms of their success? You mentioned the impact of central banks. You know, we've got potential risk of inflation um, and you know, whether we can maintain low interest rates. Are those the key three areas that, that threaten the success of, of multi-asset funds? I think we are coming back to the to the beginning. Basically, uh, multi-asset uh, management needs a lot of discipline. If you move away from this invincible core, uh, then uh, things get tricky because you move away into uh, riskier fields. You try to pick up yield, and by doing that, you lose correlation. And I think the discipline. Uh, in, in, in managing multi-asset is very, very important in order not to jeopardize your, your risk profile. I think going forward, what, what is important is, and this sounds, uh, sounds strange, but I think it's really important to stay close to investors, to really give them to transparency in order to, to formulate uh, reasonable expectations uh, clearly the overall level of uh, returns is lower than 20 years ago or 10 years ago and i think uh, by by doing that uh, you can keep this discipline this discipline approach multi-asset is about managing risk you need to be risk focused otherwise people wouldn't invest in multi-asset, they will go straight to equity. So what they want from a multi-asset investment is the risk focus. So that's, uh, that, that's key to keep this discipline. In terms of market uh, regimes, clearly what we are going to, 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 to see is, uh, or what is crucial is if the central banks will keep their influence in the market if they will uh, continue to basically support the markets and to to impute this negative correlation uh, going forward if they are able to do that then uh, multi-asset will have a, a a similar environment as they had uh, in the last two decades and i think then multi-assets strategies will be very successful mm -hmm. what i see uh, potentially on the horizon is is inflation uh, i guess that uh, we uh, we both uh, or we all uh, will see uh, some challenges uh, with respect to inflations going forward uh, it's def it's simply not it's simply not uh, how to say, I, I simply cannot imagine how, how this policy uh, will continue without triggering at, at a certain point inflation. You're talking the Whether policy it's in of five central years banks. or 10 years, I don't know, but I simply cannot see that. <laughs> All right. That's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for your time today, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.